including doctors of Ruby. No need for decorum today. Thank you. Everything is now perfect. My name is Schwad, and I work at Schwapify. Um, you may be familiar with this company by very popularized mispronunciation of the organization's name. Um, and thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, normally, I am a freelance detective in the annals of Ruby history. You may be familiar with some of my work. I'm not licensed. Uh, to date, there is no accredited body that backs up my credentials. But that's the beauty of being freelance. However, there was one re recent accolade that I'm very proud to receive, but I cannot accept for tax reasons. As of Monday, I started working for the Shopify Ruby and Rails infrastructure team, which is very exciting. Thank you. And this is solid proof that Shopify is invested in my detective work in perpetuity. So I've said this term a couple of times about Ruby archaeology, and you might be wondering, what is Ruby archaeology? I've had an interest in uh, Ruby before my time, or older Ruby, or for folks who were coding then, not old Ruby, but Ruby from you know, a few years ago. Um, and I maintain the past Ruby's newsletter, which uh, takes, does an in this day in, your, in history for Ruby. So blog posts, releases, discussions, and, and sends it in your inbox. I also wrote the portal gun gem, which takes in a gem file and gives you an executable where you can pass in a date and it'll give you a gem file pointing to that point in history. I don't know if he's in here, but Mike D'Alessio since wrote something much, much better, um, which is bundler as of. So if you actually want to do this, please use the plugin bundler as of. So thank you, Mike, for building that. Um, while going through history, I see why the lucky stiff quite a bit. And for me, um, having never met why, uh, why was the symbol of all that was whimsical and right with programming? And I think that whimsy is core to Ruby, and the care about it, and the building, and the art, and the joy, and a lot of people have talked about just enjoying writing Ruby. And this is my first actual Rails conf, and it's surreal to me to know for a fact that there's people in this room who actually worked with and interacted with Y. But for this talk, um, I want to go to a quote from Y a few weeks before he disappeared. And he said, programming is rather thankless. You see your works become replaced by superior works in a year and unable to run it all in a few more. So I say, let's run some old code. Um, I take this as a call to action for us. So today, I will briefly talk about setting up an environment for, say, Ruby 1.8, um, pretending we're in 2008 again, and uh, go through three gems from that, uh, that were in vogue around that point in history, some you might even be able to still use today, and then show them in that environment, and also look at some of the code that I found interesting from around then. So the first thing is setting up a 2009 coding environment on a 2022 machine. I lost a bit of time trying to just do this on a 2022 machine, but this isn't something that you're meant to do, right? So like Ruby 1.8 and 1.9 were uh, end of life in 2014, so that's quite a long time ago. And Ruby 1.8 wasn't even the latest, greatest Ruby for 15 years. But I feel that looking to our past is important. We have a mature language with a feature-rich, robust ecosystem, and to continue to progress forward with the language, we must keep an eye on the code, pattern, styles, and debates of the past to move forward. There's a danger to write Ruby one way, and I wanna make sure that we know that we can express ourselves and explore Ruby in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of ways to do this, um, in this particular instance, I set up uh, just a Vagrant box, and if uh, this is uh, accessible for everyone, if you're like, what in the world's Vagrant? You can just reinstall Vagrant and in it, and for this, point to an operating system that was you know, around and current as of 2008. Once that's working in your SSH into your terminal, the next problem you have is getting packaging from that time, because they'll try and point to the present. Um, so the next thing that you do is go to the sources.list and make sure that you point to old repositories so that when you do apt get, you're getting packages that are germane to 2008. But you really have to go into this archaeology seriously. Um, you, you can't halfway it, you can't think that you're an imposter. So if you see a bug, your first thought is going to be like, I'm doing something wrong. I'm running an old Ruby. That's, that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, so, so obviously I should just give up. That's not true. You're getting authentic bugs from the past. 
So you need to Google or search or DuckDuckGo or whatever search engine you're using with the timestamps that are appropriate to what you're trying to spoof, and then you'll get the results that are germane to that time. And since I never wanna change my version of Ruby in this box, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, I just did apt get install Ruby dev, 1.8.7 came in. I did install Ruby gems and get core, but that was a bit more trouble um, because it's trying to talk to something in the present and the protocol and communication isn't very good. But I did have an idea. I do have tools and I can MacGyver a few things and Ruby gems does allow you to manually download a .gem file. So that's what I did here. I just downloaded a .gem file and gem install local works um, totally fine here. And then I also MacGyvered this into another executable to make it a bit easier and also include this slight bit of recursion, but then I realized I didn't want to rebuild Ruby uh, Bundler for myself in the past and like I'm not that smart, so I just left, left it at that. And the only other thing I'd say here is, uh, remember, this is like when you, you, you always forget, it's like when you get a new Mac, you gotta install, install loads of stuff. So you're gonna be app getting everything, um, so yeah. So let's put this to the test. I've set up a little thing, and by the way, there's people much smarter in the audience than me to say, actually, here's the 10 better ways to do it. But this is a way that, in the eyes of the law, it did work. So let's put this to the test. Uh, the first gem we're gonna look at today is Markaby. Who has used Markaby? I am happy that it's a non-zero number. Uh, Markaby was a Ruby gem written by this very snappy dresser, uh, Why the Lucky Stiff, and it was unveiled and so I had to do one dependency from Y, right? So it was unveiled to the world in January of 2006 to much acclaim. The immediate discussion actually was about using this in Rails. It lets you write more Ruby in Rails. It's markup as Ruby. And if you get the time, you should go back and look at the announcement that's still there. There's an interesting discussion with a lot of people you'd know, like uh, Dave Thomas in Portland's late uh, great Ezra Zygmuntowitz. Here's a little bit of what that code ought to look like. And it's quite nice, you, maybe some of our Hamill fans in here are like, oh, the shapes are kind of similar, you know, but then you have the ends, uh, but uh, you know, but you, you probably could have visualized this in your head the second I said markup is Ruby. But you probably just want to see it, all right, fine. I'll work it on the machine. Oh, that's the, oh no, spoiler alert, ah! Okay, so this is a pre-recorded code demo from my Vagrant box because no way on earth am I gonna do a live code in uh, RailsConf and then I can alter the speed so you don't know how slow I type. So I schwad install Markaby 0.6.6, it installs, I go into IRB, I require Markaby, which doesn't work because 1.8, you had to require Ruby gems before you could require Markaby. Then you require Markaby and you get all this stuff because you know, warning, warning, warning. And then you initiate the builder and then you just author it as you think. You don't even have to, the beautiful DSLs like we got from Y. You don't have to think how it should be written or go to a manual. It'll just work as you think the blocks ought to work to spit out the text that you think it should be. And you can write a beautiful HTML page here and enjoy it. And that's, that's real, that's a 2008 fake machine. I promised you some code. Um, okay, we'll have some code here. Uh, so a few of these, and I'll, I'll mark the commit, and I'll mark the location, and, and the point in history from the commit. Um, something that we see a little bit of is uh, nested methods. And, and I was reading about this and thinking about it. It's like, it's bad, you can do it, and it doesn't do anything you expect. Here's actually okay, because you're redefining a method against object, uh, an instance of object there. But there is an interesting like use case I thought of that I don't have for the demo here of actually hiding methods inside a class by wrapping them in a method and then they don't appear until you call that method. Um, if there's some colors today that aren't accessible, I, I vocalize uh, some of these concepts so it shouldn't, so if there's a problem, I apologize. And then this, this I found really interesting um, and I guess I'll point to what I'm talking about here. So it's the, it's the builder that we use to create this, this DSL. And it actually inherits from builder blank slate. But even though this is builder.rb, this is not a, a, a file in, in Markaby. This is something that was popularized by Jim Wyrick around the time, uh, which was the blank slate class, which this inherits from to do a lot of its cool work. And you actually see it around in uh, some, some of David Heinemeyer Hansen's projects, some other of Wise projects and around the community, which is this class which uh, allows you to just, because this is a problem. If you're setting up a Ruby library that allows people to 
hit method missing and do whatever they want in like whatever word they want and build something really cool, you're gonna run into like things that are already taken and it's gonna break. You probably experienced this in real life. So what this does is it actually goes and hides everything except underscore underscore ID and underscore underscore send and instance eval, which are needed to exist. That's pretty neat and you should play around with it. So let's do another one. All right, who has used InstaKey? All right, these are my best friends. Uh, or it might be InstaKey, yes? Anyone want to yell InstaKey, InstaKey? I don't know where the emphasis is on this syllable. This was uh, unveiled by David Heinemeyer Hansen, March 31st, 2004. A very young, I'm guessing, David Heinemeyer Hansen. Um, it's a straightforward wiki uh, that runs on its own server. server, it's in Ruby, has a little SQLite file as a database, and it's shocking to me that this is never talked about. Like, DHH is still here, well, I, I, you know what I mean. Uh, InstaKey, <laughs> InstaKey used to be something in his bio, if you look at the old stuff like I do, where it was like creator of Rails, creator of InstaKey, Le Mans class race car winning driver. It's like, like, so it used to be way up there, but we don't talk about it, but it's still used. So the University of Texas physics department is using it today. Um, now to use this on a machine, I've leveled it up, right? I did something simple. Hey, we spit out some formatted text. That's really easy. Ha ha, look how smart Nick is. So now we've got to configure our box and whatever setup you use, you'll have to do this um, to talk to an outside network. Honestly, you're gonna to want to share a folder so you can use it in your actual editor unless you're crazy good at Nano or Vim or Vi and use that to communicate with the outside world. But the beautiful thing is once you have the code down, there's two steps, bundle install and Ruby InstaKey. And that's, that's it working. But you're saying, okay, fine, one more time. Let's show you um, this. Didn't practice looking over my shoulder. All right, so we sign in and create our first uh, set of admin credentials. We create, uh, we're, we're here in the real wiki. Um, we're building our wiki style, uh, I believe this is textile, it supports everything by this point in history. And we create our landing page, and you're wondering, is this gonna work? I use a wiki word, my personal blog at the bottom, I change the author, and it exists. But immediately I've created a reference to a page that doesn't exist, remember that for future. And then I'm gonna create another random page because I just feel like ranting about something that's super secret that uh, I feel like I, sh I've, I can share with you today because you're all my close friends. But I'll get to that another time. Never mind, never mind, don't have time. All right, so now we have a page that's orphaned that's not referenced by other pages and a page that's asked for. So we're gonna try and handle this in uh, one go here. And I'll see if my timing with my demo is actually, is actually working. <laughs> Um, this is the problem with doing a non-live demo is uh, then you have to like remember how fast everything was because you're not doing it. Um, so this is just like my third and final entry for this demo, uh, which is going to link in my personal blog, which was called for, and it's gonna link back to Ramp so it's not orphaned. And that's, that's, that's how Wiki works. Like that's what you're doing here. This is the thing that's neat and cool and I wish more people knew about it. Supports basic features and even the search just works. You know, pulls up stuff, pulls up stuff that doesn't exist. So that is a web application, 2008. All right, now let's go to this code. I feel like since I'm at RailsConf, I can kind of cheat a little bit, and there was some vendored Rails in the 2009 version of this. So, that, you know, it went back to 2004, so maybe not vendored then. And um, yeah, so, so uh, I, I really like this. So we all know Try, like we use Try probably all the time in, in our Rails uh, uh, applications. But what I really liked here, I, and this isn't here anymore, I don't think, because otherwise why would I talk about it? Um, but we have the try method on object, which means anything, right? Like can just send the method to itself. And then we have try on nil, so it can just nil out, you know, whenever. But I really liked about this is that it defines try and then immediately removes it. So it doesn't exist. And then it does it the way that you ought to where um, it uh, send, uh, aliases it to underscore underscore send because send can be redefined elsewhere, but underscore, underscore send in convention ought not to be. Let's look at a little bit more here. So, okay, if you've been writing Ruby for more than five or six years or three or four years, um, nothing here probably looks odd to you and maybe the colors, so I'll vocalize it and I'll point it out. But we got a bunch of ands and nots and and nots and ors, well not an or, but just about everything else. And uh, you know, I, I, I quite like a lot of older Ruby, 
used and, not an or quite frequently. And it wasn't a sin, and it wasn't like knocked down by RuboCop. But you're already like talking over me saying, but their hierarchy is different. <laughs> and, I, and, and this is the meme I will use whenever somebody disagrees when I have something to say. But I'm gonna quote what Avdi Grimm has to say about this here. And he says, I think their reputation for being confusing stems from thinking of them as Boolean logical operators at all. If you think about them that way, then you have to keep remembering how they differ from pipe pipe and amp amp. Whereas if you think about them as control flow operators only and in the same vein as if and unless, then they're more self-explanatory. Or I, I kind of think of instead of next if foo equals one, it can be foo equals one and next. I posted on Twitter about this recently because of the hierarchy and I said, what if I had a gem that reversed the hierarchy? And uh, Ruby committer Viktor Shepelev, also known as Ferok, said in all caps, why would you do that? But then he educated me more than, than what I just said to you. He said the problem with precedence is not that AND has a lower one and pi, AMP AMP has it you know, higher, that's right for code flow, um, but the problem is that AND and OR have the same precedence, but uh, AMP AMP and pipe pipe don't. But if you keep that in mind, he did agree and has been fighting for this for about four years to have the poor AND and OR and, and not come back into like Ruby reality where it's something that we, that we use like we did quite a while ago. And if you feel the same way as I do, you can go to Ruby Style Guide, pull 730, and let them know what you think as well four years later. Still going. Uh, here's another one in app models. So no, most of these are like active record objects by this point in history, by 2009. But I thought this was quite interesting because you have something, you have an object that inherits directly from string and I was thinking, well, okay, yeah, that's very interesting. That's like how Ruby works, right? You're like, I've got a thing. I'm not really doing anything interesting with it. It's a string because it's a name. But I also want to know the IP address. And instead of writing just a Poro, like plain old Ruby object with like two attributes, like, no, I'm going to inherit from string and just do it completely that way. And from the oldest commit, 2005, that I can find this is there. And it's still there today. So you can do whatever you want in Ruby, and it, and it will work, and I love it, and that's why I think it makes the language very beautiful. But if you actually do it, wet. <laughs> oh boy, I'm, I'm enjoying myself too much here. Sorry, it's fun talking about these gems. Uh, all right, I'm in Portland, last one. Who here has used Merb? All right, I, these are all the people who I'm gonna wanna get a beer with after. Um, okay. So I'll tell you a few things about MERB, if you haven't heard of MERB. I imagine more people have heard of MERB, but I'm, I'll give you a little discussion. So MERB, this is, all this stuff is a little earlier, right? So I'm using 08, 09 where things were established, but a lot of these things came into the world years before, so they were established by 2008. Uh, MERB came out in October 2006 um, by the late uh, great Portlandian Ezra Zygmuntowicz, who was one of the co-founders of Engine Yard, and it ties in Mongrel and ERB, MERB. Uh, providing basic controller and view templating. Its core competency was being lightweight and plugin based. Um, some of you who use Rota by Jeremy Evans, it kind of makes me think of that in a little way. Might be familiar with some of the style of approach. And to quote the famous Ruby Herodotus, who's still with us today, uh, Peter Cooper, where Ruby on Rails is a Big Mac, Merb is a McNugget. Or as they uh, marketed themselves, in their words, they were built for speed, lightweight, and powerful. Um, but you also might be thinking of someone else when you think of Merb, and you think of Yehuda Katz. Yehuda Katz joined the team and a lot of other core contributors. Some may be in this room. This happens to me. Uh, last conference I spoke at, I talked about a library and the maintainer was an audience. So like, you know, that's absolutely terrifying being at these big conferences um, and getting schooled by the audience. But uh, once Yehuda joined, it took off. It became a legitimate contender to Rails. In 2008, a uh, popular survey that went out saw it was the number two preferred framework in the community. There was a division. People were a little, it wasn't really a war. Oh, I wasn't there, by the way. I'm just doing this like as reading the ancient texts. But so some, some of you could educate me a bit more on that as well, who, who actually used it. But there was like, at least in evidence, a bit of a, we're this community, you're that community. But then something happened in December 23rd, 2008. The merger, the merbination, the merberber. <laughs> there was a joint announcement from both core teams that the core team of Merb was joining the core team of Rails and they were going to merge Merb into Rails. 
what did we get out of that merger? Well, first, a united community. And there was some discussion at a panel I was at yesterday about how we have just rails. But I think of the MERB merger as like a really good symbol of how we can work together and have an interesting framework that can support a diverse community. Some of the things that we got out of the merger were, you know, things can be broken up. We do have convention over configuration and we do have the Rails way, but everybody in this room knows that you can have different Rails news, right? Like different components, different bits of Rails that you wanna use. Um, it has a publicly documented API. It has um, certain parts were rewritten for speed and performance. And also we had a lot of tremendous contributors join the, the, the core team. And uh, Yehuda Katz actually documented this over um, a long time. I believe the final release, they're looking for it to be in about six months, but I think is uh, a year and a half, maybe a little over a year and a half to get this merger done. And it was documented by Yehuda with every little part. So if you wanna do a deep dive into that, you can learn more there. And there's also, which I referenced a minute ago, uh, a really good write-up by Yehuda only two years ago about the MERB story, uh, which is a bit deeper than what I've covered today. And I'd like to take a moment to just like talk about why I think this is so cool. Um, the last decade, we see code wars all the time, right? Like we see frameworks fighting each other. We see people getting FOMO. We see people thinking, is blank dead? Is blank dead? Is Y dead? Um, you know, is this or that dead? And this was a situation where two communities realized they wanted to do the same thing. So Rails 3 was looking to achieve a lot of the things that Merv was looking to achieve. And when they went and talked to David and, and, and the team, they realized that the things that they wanted to accomplish, the core team wasn't against. It's just as we've heard today, there's only so many people, only so many priorities that can be prioritized. And just because the thing you really care about isn't prioritized doesn't mean it's, it's not allowed. So when people come together, they're able to make these two frameworks become one framework, and that framework was Rails 3, which a lot of people got to enjoy. And I think a future where they stayed split would have been um, a pretty uh, difficult one. And I think we have a much more beautiful framework today because of people who are willing to put down maybe a little bit of pride and work their butts off together. So thank you to all those people of the past. Thank you. Um, <laughs> cheers. That's my sentimental moment. So you thought I had an orange handkerchief. I just could be like laughs, right? No, I'm, I'm quite a sentimental person. So, all right, let's go to the code of Merb though. Like I got a couple more Cody bits to talk about. I'm not completely done. Uh, Merb was interesting though, because there is Merb core, which was just the stripped out kind of like Rails skeleton. Uh, and then there was Merb more, right? Which had all the extra treats. Um, so this was in Merb slice. And uh, again, if you're, if you're writing Ruby for more than th or four or five years, you're like, this is just code, why are you putting this up? This is a waste of my time. But if you're writing Ruby a little more recently, you might be like, multi-line curly blocks? What? And uh, this is, I'm gonna go to Avdi again, um, talking about our use of curlies. This is like, our, we're, we're getting to like RuboCop mind, right? Like anything that's shoved into RuboCop is like now the truth. And I'm not dissing RuboCop, I, I, I think it's a really cool tool. But uh, something that Avdi had said was one approach could be to use curly brackets for functional blocks where the primary purpose is, of the block is to return a value. And then you could use do and end for procedural blocks where the primary purpose is its side effects, whatever it's doing. Um, that is the block is intended to change the state in some way and the others, uh, and then the ones to perform output. But Avdi in 2011, 11 years ago, was saying, but this isn't my idea. This is just a thing I know in the Ruby community. And he went, look, deeper and deeper and deeper. The earliest reference he could find was from the late Jim Wyrick, uh, April 30th, 2004, who said very similarly, the big remaining question on Ruby coding style is, when should you use curlies and do n? And his guideline was, curlies for returning values, do end for executed for their side effects. And he says, this is, the, and this is something I want, if you take one thing from this talk, this has the advantage of using the choice of block delimiter to convey a little extra information. You know, we're all excited, like um, I use Sorbet at work, it's so cool to have that extra information about what's going on, right? But what about the extra information about when Ruby, when you could do things two clearly different ways that do the same exact thing, you can in your organization or in your style, convey an extra bit of information to the engineer. And, and there's a lot of different ways that you can employ this in Ruby. And because of this being the earliest reference, uh, Avdi referred to it as the Wyrick Convention. And I've heard others call it the Wyrick Convention, and so I will as well. 
Another little snippet of of code here. We have a few more lines, um, so I'll highlight this one out to you, and you're like, okay, what's going on here? Did they forget to upcase their, their, their class or something? Like, what's, what's, what's going on? Well, actually, no, this is just a uh, colon method call for uh, calling a method. And I think this is a bit more rare. I, I don't think people uh, really know that you can do this, but this is exactly what I just hinted to. There are so many ways to call a method, and you probably know 12 of them, right? Like all the weird, funny, wild ways, and you hack on it with your friends and do a quiz. But colon colon is a valid way to call a method. But it's a bit unknown. It actually, if you look at the blog, 12 ways to call a method in Ruby by Gregory Wittek, it's not in the list. So when I, when I came across this, I'm like, wait, am I actually doing this right? Is there, or is Colin Colin doing some weird, like, C-level crazy stuff that I don't quite understand? But, and oh, it was right. I did pitch this over to Gregory, and I said, by the way, you can just do Colin Colin, and it'll call the method as well. And he said, after 12 years of using Ruby, he didn't know that, so it's now added to the list of ways to call a method in Ruby. Okay, let's take this one more step further. How about defining a method in Ruby? So what is self, first of all? Self is the thing, you know. Like, uh, there was a game show in here yesterday and you couldn't use certain words, and you had to say a word in Ruby. I don't know if anyone else was at that talk. Um, and so, <laughs> so that's what I'm thinking here. Self's just a thing, right? Like, self is the thing that you're in. You can't use any fancier words. So def HTML method is the same as def self. And normally you'd see def self dot reset. But this is def HTML method, colon, colon, reset, which is just as valid. Again, your linter will cry because there's only one way we're allowed to write Ruby anymore. But <laughs> it, is, it is valid Ruby. But here's the thing. It can kind of get us close to solving a pet peeve. If you, if you start writing Ruby for the first time, you see this stuff, right? We don't, write, we don't use any hashes or pound signs like when we're calling or defining or invoking a method. So we just all have to have extra knowledge in our head like that we've tribalized and built into our brain. Like, oh yeah, this is the syntax for like the method. But like, how about this? This is actually like how we're calling it and then we, then we define it in the same way. So I think um, kind of my moral on that is that there's a lot of different ways to write certain very mundane things in Ruby. And uh, our, our old authors used to use these tactics to convey extra information or even just have more fun or art in the way that they wrote things. Um, and you should consider that in your org. Um, I don't know what you'll do with your linter. I don't know. You'll have to figure that out yourself. But wow, Whew. Three, three gems that I've never talked about before in the history of time. Um, Ruby archaeology is super fun. It was, uh, by the way, you're like, where's my verb demonstration? That's an hour talk by itself. You're not getting that from me today. I'm sorry, like I did, I've cut enough content. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of gems I didn't get to use today. I actually researched um, 22 gems. I, uh, DigitalOcean, I'd like uh, uh, pulled out a 32 core machine that I ran a Ruby script in parallel to check patterns against every single commit in history to like literally find the snippets that I wanted for today. So um, if you see any gems on there that you haven't goofed around with or heard of, just like Google it and go, go have fun today if that's your thing. Um, future considerations, uh, I, love, I love any excuse to look at you know, gems from, oh wait, come on, we could go even older in history. So I, I think that I could definitely, if your organization or meetup would like a talk, and I don't even have to go into like how to set it up and I can just talk about old gems, I could probably do this forever. But I, I think besides me, like I'm just one person, I think you should become a Ruby archeologist. There's billions of lines of open source code out there, just sitting there, hosted, ignored, unused, um, that you can use. Um, and contrary, uh, uh, there's one gem from Y that I didn't show today called Bloopsophone. It was written in Ruby 1.8. Uh, it plays music it's way before Sonic Pi, and it works on Ruby 3.1 unedited. So some code does stand the test of time. But I think you should go explore and see the ways that people used to write Ruby and have it and think about it. I think things should be easily uh, re readable and shareable, and we should have conventions. But I think we need to also remember that Ruby's a sharp knife and we should know how to use the knife instead of just chopping broccoli. So my gift to you is a Vagrant box with all the work done. So you can just go, go Vagrant in it, in it, Schwad, Ruby Archaeologist, Vagrant up. You can have Ruby 1.8. You can have all the old dependencies. You can have everything set up. Even a few frameworks are in there, and you can just enjoy yourself. So I say to you, go forth. Go learn more about our amazing language and share with others. Uh, thank you so much for being here, and let's connect anytime. I love uh, being at this conference. Thank you, everyone.